Yeah, so I actually, well, I'm actually moving to Aarhus uh, in Denmark for my uh, postdoc. Um, so, but I'm between jobs now. Um, and this, this was my job market paper, joined with my PhD advisor, uh, Jordi. So we know that last year, over 100 million people de descended into extreme poverty, right? Um, and, and this is a tragedy by, by all accounts. But if there is a civil lining, it's in the decades of scholarly research that shows that money tends to buy very little effective well-being, very little experience happiness. Now, these uh, decades of, of research are still a bit at odds with what we see every day, right? Uh, every day we encounter examples of individual and mass protests that are fueled by lower economic standards. And we, we see every day people that are even too willing to risk their lives to try to escape from poverty. So in this line of research, we ask ourselves, uh, are we missing an important component of the relationship between money and happiness? One commonality that is shared by past research is that uh, it has uh, focused on static measures of well-being. So it has focused on measuring well-being either once or on average. But two people can have the exact same average happiness and live completely different emotional lives. Um, moreover, we know from decades of research in psychiatry that fluctuations in happiness are key components of many psychopathologies. From uh, bipolar disorder, anxiety and depression disorder, uh, borderline personality disorder, uh, fluctuations in effect is, are one of the key components of these uh, mental health issues. Averaging across happiness reports can also obscure rare but extreme moments of acute distress that can have far-reaching consequences in terms of uh, choice and decision-making. For example, overeating, substance abuse, or even aggression and violence. So in this paper, rather than looking, yeah, sorry. I hope you guys uh, listen to what I was talking about otherwise. <laughs> Uh, so in this paper, rather than looking at, um, at whether income uh, predicts uh, changes or predicts a higher average happiness, what we do is that we look into whether uh, income shapes the real of our emotional lives. And we do so using a data set of over 1 million happiness reports from 20, over 23,000 uh, French participants who pro whose happiness was tracked in real time using a smartphone app. Uh, participants uh, that had this app uh, received uh, prompts at, at random times and they were asked to report their happiness on a 0 to 100 scale uh, from very unhappy to very happy. Uh, we developed the methods uh, on how to efficiently measure fluctuations in, in happiness in a companion paper that we have with uh, Maxime Taquet, who's, who's a uh, researcher here at the uh, psychiatry d department. So our results uh, allow us to replicate past work that has established a relationship between income and average happiness, which is the, uh, this, uh, this plot. Um, but we also find a uh, robust relationship between income and happiness fluctuations, which in this example we operationalize as the uh, standard deviation in happiness reports. Now this relationship is extremely robust. So we consider uh, over 180 specifications with different uh, operationalizations of income, different treatment for missing variables, um, mostly, most important, the five main measures of affect uh, variability and instability that are uh, used in the psychiatry literature. Um, across these 180 specifications, the, the relationship between income and uh, happiness volatility or emotional volatility is, is jointly significant. And what I think is more important is that we also find this relationship when we look at these uh, 
Uh, when we look at a sample of individuals from uh, developing countries. So results are not only uh, specific to rich industrialized uh, individuals, but also replicate when we, uh, when we take a look at the emotional lives of over 25,000 individuals uh, from, from six developing countries. Now you're probably wondering whether uh, apart from being statistically significant, our relationship has, has some psychological uh, meaning, right? It's psychologically meaningful. Uh, and we do think so. Uh, if we look at the effect sizes, if we look at the differences in emotional volatility uh, for those earning 1,000 euros uh, per month and 5,000 euros per month in our French uh, data set, uh, we find differences in emotional volatility that are in the ballpark of the differences that past literature in psychiatry finds uh, between healthy individuals and individuals that have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Um, our differences in emotional volatility, oh, I see you cannot see the, the plot. Well, it's, it's around 0 0.4 uh, in both cases. Um, the differences between emotional uh, volatility uh, between low and high income individuals are roughly half in size of those uh, differences that we find between um, uh, healthy individuals and individuals with borderline personality disorder. So in both cases, these differences are not only statistically significant, but they, they, they're psychologically meaningful. Now, you're probably thinking that whether, um, yeah, whether um, our results uh, convey some, some form of information, that they're based on summary statistics, right? Like uh, standard deviation or, or some other summary statistics that, that reflect uh, emotional volatility, but don't really capture what, what, what is the shape of this emotional volatility. Um, so in order to really gain a deeper understanding of, of how income shapes the real of, of our emotional lives, what we do is that we consider uh, three different types of, of volatility, right? Uh, so we argue that volatility can take uh, three main, main uh, forms. Uh, can either be uh, that low income individuals experience more extreme uh, or frequent uh, periods or sequences of extreme negative effects. So uh, periods or sequences of extreme unhappiness. It could also be that these individuals experience more frequent or intense periods of extreme happiness. And it could also be that they just experience more periods or roller coaster increased uh, changes. So in order to detect these changes, we ran a uh, anomaly uh, detection algorithm that allows us to capture both points and sequences that are anomalous to a person's time series of happiness. Uh, and we classify these uh, anomalies into uh, the, the three types using a clustering algorithm. And then for this, uh, for each of these uh, clusters or for each of these uh, anomalous points and sequences, we uh, identify for each individual the, the frequency, the intensity, and the duration of, of these uh, anomalies. What we find is that yeah, the plot is not uh, very good, the quality in, in the projector. But what we find is that for periods and sequences of extreme happiness, money does not predict any of the, its characteristics. So money does not predict um, the intensity, the frequency, or the duration of points or sequences of, of or periods of times of, of extreme happiness. It does not predict the uh, duration, the the frequency or the intensity of those periods of extreme uh, changes of, or roller coaster type of sequences, but it does predict the intensity and the frequency of periods of extreme unhappiness. And what we see is that the, eff uh, the effect sizes, again, are, are quite large. So we know that uh, the difference in average happiness for an individual making 1,000 euros per month and 5,000 euros per month is around 4.5 points. Um, the differences in happiness during these acute periods of, of distress for, for these individuals are three times as large. So uh, approximately 13 points from 20 
for low-income individuals to uh, 33 in a 100-point uh, scale. Uh, we also see that these uh, sequences of extreme, we, we also see that these sequences of extreme unhappiness are more common for low-income individuals. And, and we estimate that the differences for uh, for those earning 1,000 and 5,000 euros in terms of the frequencies, around 30%. Okay, so so low-income individuals experience over 30% more uh, sequences of extreme uh, happiness. Finally our, uh, yeah, finally, our data does not allow us to clearly get at the causality of, of this relationship, uh, but we can use the exogeneity in monthly payments to see whether our results uh, are consistent with a causal interpretation of this relationship. Um, now, our main uh, sample is French, right? And so people in France get paid once at the end of the month. Um, so what we see is that at the end of the month, um, low-income individuals tend to experience more anomalous uh, moments or sequences of happiness. But we don't see that for high-income individuals. Now, this is consistent with the causal interpretation. As we argued, the last few days of the month are when people usually are running shorter on, on, on money, especially low-income individuals. Um, so this seems to suggest that the relationship between income and happiness volatility is, is causal. Although further research needs to clearly get at the causality of, of this relationship. And so I think that's, that's basically it. Um, yeah, the, the main point is that income predicts happiness volatility. Uh, this is partially explained by the existence of these moments or sequences of extreme distress. And uh, these, these moments uh, of, of anomalous happiness are clustered towards the end of the month for uh, low-income individuals, uh, but not for high-income individuals, which suggests that the relationship is causal. If you, yeah, if you have mo any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Uh, if you want more information, I think the, the working paper is in my webpage, and you can also email me. Uh, yeah, feel free to, to email me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I think the finding about the uh, low income and anomalous moments of happiness is really interesting. And I was just curious, like, what could be going on there? Like, is it, you know, really happiness that's born from feeling like great about having the extra cash, or is it happiness that's born from a relieval of stress, for instance, where it's, you know, if you've been kind of burdened by thinking about this throughout the whole month and then uh, that stress is relieved, is that what causes the boost? And what can we kind of understand maybe about? the nature of, of happiness at a, a deeper level, kind of from seeing that pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think my, or our research uh, talks a bit uh, to past research that, that shows that uh, typical moments of, of uh, extreme happiness, right, are moments of social connection uh, and moments when we are uh, surrounded by the people that, that, that we love. Uh, so what it seems to suggest is that, you know, it's, uh, or I think it talks about this Asymmetry in the effect of money on, on happiness, so it does not really have an effect on uh, on the positive side of happiness, but it does seems to, to, to have an effect on, on the negative side of happiness, which also I think goes back to some of the uh, some of the research that, that shows that the, the relationship between income and, and sadness is is way greater than between income and, and happiness. Um, uh, so as to the specific mechanisms, I think we are still trying to work on that. Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, hopefully, we'll we'll get uh, a, like a better answer in, in a few months. Uh, but uh, yeah, we will we'll try to to look at the specifics of the you know situational context that that uh, that it can can explain a bit the, the relationship between income and and these extreme moments of of distress.
Thanks, if I have permission to ask a question. Um, thank you for that presentation. Um, I'm interested in whether there's a baseline of, you know, be it poverty or what you call low income, if it's, for instance, um, somebody who is unemployed, does this still hold when it's not somebody who's just low income, but the idea of, you know, being able to support oneself, um, would that have the same pattern uh, or, or would that look different? So uh, specifically about like unemployment, we, we control for unemployment in some of our specifications and, and it still works. Um, whether, yeah, whether it, uh, it, it can be expanded to the, this idea, right, of financial hardship or like being able to uh, provide for, for oneself, uh, I think that's, that's a bit more of a stretch uh, with our data because we don't, we don't have much data on people's perception of whether, you know, like, how difficult they, or how much they struggle to, to make it to the end of the month and, and everything like that. Um, so, so yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't really get at that, but that's, that's a very, uh, very cool topic for f future research. Yes, uh, so I was wondering how much information you have about context based on the survey tool uh -huh. you're um, using. And this, I asked this because I was actually surprised that you have this clear pattern that this, this stress goes up at, towards the end of the month because mm -hmm. I would have expected that these poor people make experiences during the months that really hurt them because it's against their identity and it's really hurting their self. And that is related to their poverty. And your story seems to be more one of financial distress. Uh -huh. And maybe it would help if we could know more about the context during which they are asked or, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so we have information on the activity they, that they are engaged, uh, the people that they are uh, spending time with. Um, and I think that's the, <coughs> that's the main uh, measures of uh, contextual information that, that we have. Um, they, all the, the surveys are type of in the moment, right? So ask in the specific moment. So I'm not sure uh, whether it could be uh, a matter of the past choices and, and identity uh, that, that, that could explain these, uh, these results. Um, I, I think the I think the most plausible type of explanation is the one about um, financial difficulties at the at the end of the month. Uh, but again, uh, we need to to look into that a bit more. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would say the, the the most like plausible explanation is probably that you know lo low income individuals are really struggling. It's also we also find uh, for very um, for very like high income groups. Uh, we find some somewhat like a, an inverse uh, U-shape in, in the moments of uh, anomalous uh, uh, happiness. And, and correct me if, if I'm wrong, but in, um, in France, you usually pay taxes uh, uh, at the like halfway through the month. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, no? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah? Oh, okay, 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 okay. okay. So uh, no, because I, I I showed this slide with the inverted U shape, and someone say, oh, that's when uh, like rich people pay taxes. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, I, I couldn't I couldn't translate the the um, the stuff from from uh, from France. So uh, so yeah, I think I think the most plausible explanation is probably the the one about financial hardship. Uh, but the, I, I also think it is it's interesting the the idea of that it might have some identity costs uh, that carry throughout the month. I'm going to chip in then, if I may. Um, there are two other papers out there uh, with this finding. I don't know whether you know either of them. They're, they're, they're not published. So if you don't know about those two papers, I can tell you something about them. Uh -huh. Uh, which is good news in the sense that you're, you've got the right answer. Um, and I really like the fact that you've used the timing of the monthly salary slip, essentially looking at the end of the month, because I think those other two papers didn't think of that. So um, that, 
that does seem important. As far as I remember, I asked the other two sets of authors when I saw these papers, they're working papers, may not be in the public domain at all, I'm not sure. I, I asked them about um, skewness, of course, and I don't think you talk much about the skewness of the distribution because, of course, w we'd like to know, um, uh, w one or two of your slides were blurry, of course, so maybe it was in there, but we'd like to know whether really we're cutting off um, a lot of skewness on the downside in, in bad feelings by having money. You see what I mean? There's no reason to expect symmetry here. So do we know anything about the skewness of the volatility distribution? You with me? Yeah, yeah, and I, I think it's a very similar idea to, uh, to our findings, right? So what we find is that the differences are on the extreme of the distribution of people's uh, emotional lives. This is what, dri what, what is driving the differences in emotional volatility between low and high income individuals. Symmetry, where people, uh, when bad things happen, shoot down a long way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that money is st stopping that heavy asymmetry in emotional response. Mm -hmm. Do we know that? Yeah, yeah. So we we don't formally test that that idea, but I I think it it is consistent with with um, uh, the results that I presented on the anomaly detection. Uh, algorithm results, right? Uh, so we just see that the, the extreme moments of distress for high income individuals are not as, as intense or not as bad as, as the extreme moments of distress for low income individuals. So I think that's, that's a bit similar if I'm, if I'm uh, getting at it correctly. Um, uh, similar idea, but maybe from, from different uh, approaches, right? Uh, methodological approaches. Okay, and if, if I'm just allowed to pursue this, because in principle we have a few more minutes, you, you showed uh, monotonically increasing mm -hmm. uh, happiness and income schedule, mm -hmm. and I slightly lost track of the x axis, what the mm -hmm. numbers were, but the for the volatility diagram, which was very interesting, s sweeping down, uh -huh. it did go flat eventually, or pretty flat. Yeah. And I'm just wondering what kind of income level, in, like in real euro terms, real dollar terms, mm -hmm. what, uh, at what level is it, it going flat? Okay, 2,000, uh -huh. 2,500 monthly income or something. Yeah, yeah uh, I think the, uh, okay. the, uh, our top income uh, group is 6,000 euros per month. The, the what is 6,000? Uh, the top income group that, that right. we have. Okay. Right, so if I get to that level of income, mm -hmm. then uh, adding more cash to me doesn't change volatility. Exactly. Right, okay, that seems like a finding. Mm -hmm. Right, shall we go and have some lunch or would anybody else like to ask a question? Right, let's uh, give this gentleman a clap. Thank you very much. Thank you.